There will be blood is a statement Peter Mertens made in an interview with me one year ago. Peter worked 35 years in the automotive industry and I, you know, counted 10 different board positions, which I call really very, very impressive. These board positions include Audi, VW Group, Volvo, Polestar, Jaguar Land Rover, Foratiar, and today he works for smaller startups, again in board positions. So if there is someone who really has a broad experience, it's Peter. I had today present a second opportunity to interview Peter, and this time we talked two hours, and it was once again a big pleasure. I'm honored, and it was a lot of fun too talking to Peter, and I'm very certain you're gonna enjoy the two-hour interview with him as well. Peter, it's a, it's a great pleasure to have you, you back here after one year. I mean, I, I just checked my, my files and it's, it's almost exactly a year that we talked in an interview. And in that interview, you also said, it will be bloody, there will be blood. So a year passed by and I'm asking myself, you know, what happened in the last year and what's your opinion about the German, in particular the German automotive industry, uh, right now after after that year and what changed uh, are, are you still believing it's going to be bloody or is the situation different i think this first of all thank you very much for having the opportunity it's really uh, you know always a pleasure uh, talking to you uh, because in you know different to many other people in in the uh, let's say journalist area you really go into the depths and into the details which i really appreciate a lot um it is, you know, things have changed a lot during the last 12 months. And I would in particular say during the last six months, um, there has been a lot of good developments happening. Still, there will be blood. And you probably very much remember Sergio Marchione. Um, he had been talking about, you know, the automotive industry and the consolidation that is in front of us since years. Uh, I have been talking about that uh, even very recently. Markus Duisman, the, the Audi CEO, talked about it. And I think we all came to the same conclusion. Not everybody will survive. Um, likely in the you know, OEM area, but also very much in the uh, supply base. Um, so that's why I'm saying it is going to be bloody still. But the positive momentum that we have seen by VW, by Mercedes, by BMW in the last six months on a much, much stronger commitment towards um, the electrification, towards you know, their own effort in terms of battery uh, knowledge and, and you know, um, responsibilities in terms of I don't know they, they, whether they call them gigafabrics or megafabrics or whatever, in contrast to Tesla, or they use the name word, the same word, I don't know. But I think that is something where I see a very, very, very positive uh, trend and turn towards a, a better future of the German automotive industry. So um, who will survive is probably one of the most frequent questions I'm getting every day on Twitter in particular, but not only. Um, and I'm, I'm personally hesitant to, to name anybody because in particular the international community is very quick in saying, you know, VW is gonna be bankrupt or BMW or Daimler. Uh, you know, both of us are Germans and, and we've been growing up with this companies kind of hearing about them day in, day out almost. In particular, I suppose of us are engineers. Um, so when you are saying not everybody is going to survive, uh, my personal opinion is it's, it's good to differentiate in between supplier base and the, and the OEMs, yeah. which you just did. Yeah. Um, and secondly, I, I wonder, you know, there, there's, 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 there are a lot of shades of gray in terms of bankruptcy. So yeah. it's not like, a company is going to go in chapter 11 and, and, and going to be bankrupt and the name is disappearing. That's not what I personally believe is going to happen. 
but there is still something like a bankruptcy still going to happen if you, for instance, have you're losing influence on your own company, you are losing the majority of shares of your company, you are losing the stakeholders in the board and then the advisory board. So let, if you go a little bit deeper, I mean, we have we have situation that VW Group is a very special situation because it's partly back from the lower Saxony government that, that, that owns a big share and we have a special law even for that and, and you name it, you know all that. You've been active at VW and Audi, so it's, yeah. um, it's clear. But that's not the case with Daimler and, and, and BMW. So um, who do you see is kind of in a risky position, if I may ask, um, from the OEMs? And then we can later on talk about the supplier base. But yeah. um, on, on, the, on, the, on the big name side, who is, who is, who is I mean, lagging behind in BEVs? I think we, we know this a little bit also in terms of technology. But, you know, bankruptcy is not coming because you have necessarily the worst technology at least not at start it's it usually comes with um, you know cash flow issues for instance if you have problems to finance yourself but also if your pace of innovation is not fast enough yeah. so if you would make such a list kind of the big companies what would your answer be yeah it's it's uh, i'm not going to make a list but I, I can give you some examples um, and and i can start with saying I do not believe that there will be a lot of bankruptcies where really, you know, companies uh, are going completely out of business and, and, you know, file chapter 11 or something like that. Why do I think so? Yeah, well, it is, there's so much money in the market that, and, and also on the, on the government, government side, so much effort in supporting companies in difficult uh, financial situations that there is the likelihood of zombie companies uh, being created, which I think is a, is a drama, it's a big disaster. Um, and I think it's also one of the negative side effects of the huge help that the, um, the industry got through the Corona times. Don't get me wrong, I think it was really important to make sure that there was enough liquidity and that we had the, you know, the German word Kurzarbeit uh, instead of unemployment, um, all of that was really important and well put that you see the numbers of the big, let's say, uh, OEMs, uh, they, they have record uh, sales and record uh, revenues and, and profits uh, in the first half of this year. So that's good. Um, on the other hand, we have seen already consolidation over time. I mean, part of a consolidation is the merger between uh, Fiat Chrysler and, and the, you know, the Peugeot Citroën group, which ended up in Stellantis. That is a consolidation. Um, with that, you now you can also see very much, and that is something that really, I have to say, hurts me a bit, um, what happened to Opel. I mean, over the years, they were a very important part of General Motors in the 90s, really also saving the, the GM from going into you know, big financial troubles. And then you know, mismanagement, mismanagement on the technical side, on how the brand was perceived, etc., put that company into further and further and further into a position where it became less and less and less relevant. And, and frankly speaking, I have a tremendous respect uh, for Carlos Tavares and his team, how they have managed to put, after 25 years of loss making, have put Opel back into profitability. But the price for that is actually that Opel is no longer a real automotive company anymore. It's a brand. It uses uh, the technology that is existing in the, you know, Peugeot, um, uh, Citroën Group, and now in Stellantis. It is less and less engineering related. It is no longer what we always said when I was at Opel, is German engineering. No, it's not. And it, it lost its relevance in the market as a automotive company and will survive as a brand. And I would doubt that even the brand will survive, uh, frankly speaking, with now, what happened uh, lately, I'm not so sure whether that is, is sustainable. But that's one of the examples on consolidation 
um, and and you know having to rely on on significantly increased economies of scale and share as much as possible on the investment and the and the you know, very very expensive engineering side on as many cars as possible yeah and that's yeah. that's very obvious the further technology evolves the more electrification the more connectivity the more um, you know autonomous drive ad safety requirements all of that the more you will have to spend for engineering and for investment and that is going to be very, very difficult for small companies, smaller companies. So you you said a couple of very important things. You one one word that sticks is, is zombie companies, which is um, which is partly a wrong characterization in my understanding, because a zombie usually continues to live a gap regardless what you do with. No, but with that is zombie. what I was saying. That is yeah. exactly what I meant. We, okay. we support companies that actually don't have a business model that really works with you know, government money to help it survive. Uh, and, and maybe it's wrong to say forever, but for a, a certain period of time, even though it has no, no um, real product or business model that would survive without the support. So another thing that concerns me personally is um, with all the incentives and, and, and money, I mean, um, governments are given in there, which is almost like a sort of a bailout, if you will. They, they, they keep these companies alive on the one side. On the other side, the pressure, internal pressure in terms of innovation and transforming into a working business model is decreasing. So... Um, it's like, you know, you don't see the problems anymore, almost, because there is enough cash in house. Exactly. And um, you postpone um, unpleasant decisions, probably internally. So um, this is a development I, I personally, I do see in particular um, happening with BMW and with, with, with Daimler um, from, from the outside. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an insider. Uh, but just looking at numbers and, and listening to interviews, I, I get the impression that they are really very, very late to the party. I'm talking here about the transformation to PEVs and, and, and autonomous. While VW Group, uh, including you know, Audi, where you've been responsible for R&D, um, is um, much more clear in their strategy moving ahead. On the other side, if I look at the technology and what they bring right now in terms of pace of innovation, I personally do see all the issues and challenges you have with such a huge tanker uh, on, the, on the ocean that you try to turn around because, I mean, all the suppliers needs to live somewhere and the, the business model of VW Group relies very much, you know, um, using the supplier base in order to create and drive, um, you know, new models and new innovations. Yeah. So um, let, let's think about the future a little bit here. We, we, I think we both agree they are in trouble to, to the one or the other extent, but how do you see this as developing? Yeah, and I would like to quickly come back to, you know, let's say, those three companies and, and sure. how one uh, could, could see what is happening. I, I completely agree with your uh, statement that the clearest strategy is absolutely with VW Group. I mean, there's, there's no debate on is uh, BEF the right way or not. It has been, this is a tone from the top. I mean, Herbert Dies has been preaching this from the beginning and absolutely focusing this big tanker on it. And yes, it takes quite some time to do a turn with a big tanker. Turning angle is, you know, it's a bit wider and it takes uh, time, but still, you know, the vehicles that are on the market right now, ID3, ID4, um, the, uh, the uh, Q4, Atron, the Atron GT, um, all of this, and, and you know, even Skodas and Seats, 
all those products are pretty good. Are they as good as, you know, we have to admit still technology leader Tesla yet? No, they aren't. There is, you know, a, a I think a uh, advantage that Tesla has in a couple of areas. One is the electrical architecture. One is still the battery uh, um, uh, chemistry and the battery management system. You can see that in the figures where, you know, what is the, um, the use, how much, uh, you know, kilowatt hours for 100 kilometers, where usually and then always uh, actually Tesla is, is the best and then comes the rest. But it is a very, very strong statement towards the commitment towards electrification and it's good looking and attractive cars. So, so far, so good. If I look at BMW and Mercedes, both are a bit more hesitant. I would say the most hesitant is actually BMW on uh, their way on you know, using uh, all existing and future uh, propel, propel, uh, propulsion, propulsion systems, uh, in, including BEVs and, and you know, plug-in hybrids, but also combustion engines. Much more diverse, much less focused uh, on you know, this one and only answer of battery electric vehicles. We will see at the end what was uh, the better approach. I'm in the meantime very, very much convinced that you know, we all would have to focus much stronger on battery electric and, and you know, go out of uh, combustion engine as quick as possible. Um, I don't see a good future for plug-in hybrids anymore. And I said different, I have to say, a couple of years ago. Um, you can read interviews from myself when I was still with Volvo cars saying the opposite, the plug-in hybrid is the bridge technology towards uh, you know, battery electric vehicles, in, but in a further outward um, uh, future. And, and I think I was wrong. I was wrong and maybe with that also you know, misleading uh, in terms of the prioritization. If you look at uh, Mercedes, a brave step in, in, in you know, putting the company into twi two separate uh, units. If you look at it from a, um, let's say, um, you know, economies uh, of, of scale or from synergy kind of point, I think there is not a lot of synergies between trucks and cars. And with that, I think the focus on future investment on, on passenger cars only is the right one. I have seen with, with uh, some, um, yeah, I, I regrets actually that Sajad Khan has left uh, uh, Mercedes. Right. Um, I think he was, he was really one of those guys pushing into new technology, into battery electric vehicles, into connectivity, into autonomous drive, etc. cetera. You know, one needs to see what is happening uh, after he has left. I have no clue. Uh, but you know, put a... As, as a quick summary, if I may, VW with, with Audi uh, and Porsche, by the way, um, and all the other brands, but mainly you know, Porsche and Audi being the, the lead frog of, of the uh, uh, VW group, very much committed to electrification on a very strong and, and good uh, development. Um, Mercedes somewhat in between BMW, I don't know. I, I don't understand the guys. I can't follow it. And I, I you know they will they will have a plan which I don't understand, but that's not their fault, it's my fault. Well, first of all, thanks for your open words. I mean, there's not a lot of top executives, former or now, who would um, you know admit to have been wrong in the past about hybrids. Um, and I think we touched on that. That's probably one of the moments where you've seen me a little bit restless on my seat at that moment in time because I'm I'm against hybrid since a long time uh, for actually mainly technical reasons, to be honest. I, I don't see the merit in, uh, in it as a bridge technology. Um, it's, a, it's a revenue, it, it brings revenue in for those companies but, and because you get incentives, it's, it's, it's a good seller and we have big sales numbers, but I don't see long-term that this is very helpful because um, it, it, it helps companies to continue development, ICE technology in-house and 
as we just discussed, if you don't focus fully on on, on yeah. BEVs, you're gonna be in a. I mean, these companies are partly already in a difficult situation. Talking about Daimler, which which if if, which, if I may, and and you sure. can you you absolutely cut it out if you want to, and I don't want to try to defend my my decisions oh, no. made That's in fine. in the past when we decided at Volvo Cars for. Uh, putting uh, plug-in hybrids uh, as a standard offer into our vehicles. I think that was still a brave and, and, and at that point of time, still a good decision because we were then able to kick out eight cylinders, five cylinders, six cylinders to have same performance with a plug-in hybrid uh, version. And that was actually the plan and, and it worked out. But of okay. course, you know, today, different situation. And there is, again, no doubt, BEV needs to be the focus, without any doubt. But, well, there's, there's the under, yeah, I agree. I mean, there is the underlying issue to transform a huge company in the automotive sector into a battery electric vehicle company. So even if you overcome that what in Germany is called technologie offenheit, which is a yeah. oxymoron in my understanding, because this is a word that, you know, I mean, it's it kind of implies that if you have a benefit, if you do everything a little bit, which we see with BMW, so hydrogen and hybrids and BEVs and ICE vehicles, so four different um, types of vehicles uh, developed. And you said it rightly. I mean, they have not only the production as an issue, which you have to, where you have to combine all of that, but you have to develop four different drivetrains over time, which is creating additional costs. You have to have suppliers who supplies a different part somehow. So the complexity, not only in supply chain logistics, but also manufacturing is increasing quite quite a bit. But um, let, let's switch over from BMW to Daimler a little bit. So Daimler is going to, um, to become two companies, as you, as you correctly said, uh, truck business and passenger car business, which and I agree to that. I mean, if you think about what is the overlapping business where it's helpful to have it together. Yeah, marketing, sales, management, you know, maybe a little bit supplies here and there, but not that much anymore. And uh, so it's questionable. So Kilenius already said that before. He also said the company is going to shrink. Uh, you're probably aware that they pay quite high, uh, you know, settlement packages for people who are going to leave up to 400,000 euros, which is quite amazing. Um, and some of these people actually left to, to, to Tesla in, uh, in, in Berlin, even and taking the package as a kind of personal bridge, which is, which is obviously not what, what Daimler wanted here. Um, but, you know, and, and we've seen the technology, also the, uh, the new EQS, which is, has quite impressive numbers on the luxury side and, and all of that. However, the company is, is shrinking in terms of revenue and people on board. And the investment in terms of R&D is not shrinking, it's, it's growing. And the CTO just left, as you said, which is not necessarily always a negative indication, but I agree. He was someone who had a vision and with a lot of experience. And and uh, from the PR, it doesn't sound like this was long for, planned for a long time. But anyway, um, I'm, I I think that 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 the risk we are running here is that because sales numbers look good, which may be a little bit pent up demand from the COVID year last Absolutely. year. Absolutely yes. Um, so there is an over. There's kind of a. There are a lot of people, you know, 50% of all passenger cars are uh, replacements. So people need to buy a car because they just need one to do their job and to drive home and everything, you know, commute to work. So this 50% of cars that couldn't be bought last year is swapping over into this year. This is at least, I believe, a part of the explanation. And then we have, of course, the semiconductor challenges here in the market that are creating issues. So what these guys are doing, and I probably would do the same is, you know, allocating the semiconductors to the high margin vehicles. Of course. And, and that's, that explains why profits are going through the roof. So revenue and profit numbers look awesome. So why the heck do we worry, right? So it, it feels like everything is fine, but you have to really be an expert like yourself to understand there, there are underlying issues. My problem that I have is, and that's a question to you. Do, do you believe the, the, the pressure to innovate is, is, is decreasing 
and and what would be the result um, over time um, from from that effect? Okay, I, I I answer the question first, and then I'll come back to the question of you know what do they do in the crisis? I think the the pressure on innovation is increasing, and um, okay. I, that is understood by everybody, and that is also reflected in in the numbers uh, of the engineering budgets. I think one of the first things uh, Duisman did when he joined uh, Audi, I think he spent a billion more on, on the engineering budget or something like that, which was, I think, a very, very bold statement in terms of, okay, we need to get back to technology leadership and it needs money and allocation and the right people for that. Um, so I don't think that the focus on innovation is, uh, is going to be reduced. I think it is strengthened. Um, looking at the published uh, half-year numbers of you know, all the automotive companies, but very much the you know, big three Germans, you can see that they have been printing money uh, during uh, the first six months. And one of the reasons is exactly what you mentioned, is a very clever shift from small cars to big, big cars with high revenues and, and profit margins, of course. But they have also, and I didn't know they, you know, Daimler was paying 400,000 for people to leave, but they have also used the time, the pand pandemic on uh, making, becoming leader in, in, in being, you know, uh, less, uh, um, you know, overstaffed, being uh, too slow, being not just too much uh, money in overheads uh, where it doesn't actually create any value, um, which you will see and have seen also as part of this you know, big revenues and, and profit gains. But I can absolutely, and, and I'm, I'm, sh I'm hoping I'm wrong, I can guarantee you numbers will go down. Um, latest by next year. And the funny thing is, and that's actually a, a almost contradiction in terms, but why is the profit so high? Because most of the cars being sold is traditional old vehicles with combustion engines. Um, S-classes and SUVs and all those kind of uh, vehicles, uh, some of which you know, are electric, but only very, very few. The more the, the penetration of battery electric vehicles gains uh, in, in terms of the, you know, um, ratio uh, between BEF and, and combustion engine or ICE, uh, the more difficult it is to make these kind of margins and money. I read an article or an interview from Duisman also for, for, for you know, quoting Duisman so often, but he's, sure. he is, he's very you know, active uh, in, in, in his way of communicating, which I think is great. He's saying, okay, right now we do start to know how to get uh, money out of BEF and, and we will maybe even be able to earn more money with battery electric vehicles than we do with ICE now. This implies that with Euro 7, ICE engines, etc., uh, are much, much more complicated and, and costs go up significantly, which they also would for the customers. Um, and it implies that you know, it is a development that goes over time and it goes over three to five years. I think that's also important to understand right now, still difficult to make money with battery electric vehicles. We know that even Tesla still does only make their profit with selling CO2 um, um, you know, um, uh, credits. Um, but there is a way towards redu reduction of cost, increase of uh, energy density, um, in decrease of raw materials in batteries, all of that. That does not seem to be just a hope anymore. It looks like there is a you know, clear plan. There is some certainty in it and the plan is, plan is gonna be executed a year more or less doesn't count in the broader scope. Um, that actually makes me happy to see that. But again, the warning I have is in the next coming years, we will not see those kind of fantastic numbers we have seen right now because batteries are right now still very expensive and it, you know, it takes time to get into the production you know, um, efficiencies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
So I agree to everything you said, um, but one. So let me uh, let me say that uh, Tesla in the last quarter made without credits uh, about 700 million in profits. So even no, if I would always that, almost do a bet uh, that 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 isn't correct. Uh, let's let a good bottle of champagne on it. Let's do that. This is um, this is now sealed sealed deal. I send you the numbers um, so that you you can review it and um, and we will have a good bottle of champagne one day we'll, we'll, we'll have it anyways once we can meet again we'll drink it bring, yeah, bring it together happy to do that happy to do yes. that so um but uh, uh, putting that aside um there is a very important point you made here which a lot of people overlook overlook which is the profit margin which you do with pvs and if you differentiate uh, the more luxury pvs like the e-tron where you've been partly re responsible for yep. bringing it to market and the Taycan, so um, let's say more high-end uh, German BEVs, which are, I assume, probably are profitable already. Yes, um, they are. Yes. Given the numbers um, they have, so Etron is selling well, uh, Taycan is selling well, which is great. Um, but you know, one of the biggest challenges Elon Musk said that what keeps him awake at night is that that, that you know. PVs are still too expensive for for the normal um, income. So, mm -hmm. for people to to buy a car, I mean, to be honest, I mean, the, my first car I've ever bought was, was about I don't know eight years ago or so. It was a Porsche actually, but I've never had a car of my own before because it was freaking expensive in Germany to buy a car. And uh, so I bought a used Porsche, and it was a great car to drive. But it was for me already a car that's totally outdated at that point in time it was still fun to drive but I, I switched over to a tesla later on a model 3 which at that point in time was kind of the one of the cheapest bevs in the market and now we have some some cheaper ones which is great um also from german automakers but we also have this effect of compliance cars so um, like the e-up or other cars from vw which are only sold in small numbers and the order books are partly closed because if they sell too many it's just you know a lot of um, loss what they make with i think them. they have stopped the the e-up i don't think that the e-up is still yeah. available anymore i don't think so they, they still deliver but i'm not sure why maybe they produce batches and have stored them somehow something like that but um, what I'm trying to say here is with the acceleration of the transformation that we see right now, I mean, we have the Model Y coming to Europe now uh, in delivery, which is a little bit more expensive, but there is also a compact car that is hopefully coming soon. There is a Model Y short range, and there is a lot of Asian cars from China, which yeah. are pretty good in quality. Uh, yes. You know, we, we Germans are always a little bit arrogant here with our panel gaps and paint and you name it. Yeah. But the reality is Chinese vehicles are really, really nice. And some of them, I mean, Neo and others are coming to Europe. So what I'm trying to say here is following. Um, in the past, German automakers made a lot of revenue and also money with, um, you know, smaller cars, smaller form factors, and not only the big expensive ones. Do, do you see the industry shrinking over time here by others taking away that, you know, lower cost segment in BEVs? No, I don't think so. You know, you know the, the, the reality is nobody is making money with small cars, not in, in ICE <laughs> nor in, in battery electric. I don't know whether you saw the uh, half year numbers. I think Audi was at 12% um, uh, operating margin and Porsche is, I think, at 15 or 16 or you know, crazy numbers. And if I'm not mistaken, VW rent is at 4%. I mean, that, that shows actually the difficulty on making money um, in non-premium smaller vehicles. It, it will come. And I mean, the Renault Zoe is a good example for a small, affordable car. Right. I, I have no idea whether they make a lot of money. I'm sure they don't make a lot of money on it. I hope they make a little money on it. And uh, I'm sure they do. Um, but this is, this is one of the concepts which seem to fly. Mm -hmm. And one of the prerequisites to that is also we as, as customers 
um, need to feel more comfortable with lesser, smaller ranges. I mean, there is no need for everybody to have 400, 500 kilometers of range for a car that is only going to be driven in, in cities. And, you know, every once in a while you drive it somewhere uh, where you can, with all the new um, sales models, um, you can have a, a different car. If you long, need a car for a longer drive, you know, you just get drive to your dealer just, you know, and, and get a bigger car with a bigger range. What I'm trying to say is many, many, many people of us don't only drive like 10, 15, maximum 20 kilometers per day, even if they drive like 50 or 100. If they had their own charging station, if finally all the, you know, employee, employee, employers, the, the companies would build up charging stations, stations for all their employees, then there's no big need for ranges that are 350 plus kilometers. And then small electric vehicles can be built and offered at significantly lower prices uh, without you know, missing out on anything. You don't miss on, out on safety, you know, don't miss out on, on comfort and, and all of that. Just a bit of compromise on range, uh, which I think we will all learn that we're gonna uh, don't have to have like you know this is the, the typical diesel guys like you know I have to admit I was and, and still a bit of a diesel fan you now you drive thousand kilometers without uh, having to stop at a gas station that's you know that's spoiled thinking and that is and, and range becomes a fetish almost yeah and and that's wrong you you know we yeah, should be thinking we should be thinking about what do we really need. And, and yeah, if I want to drive and go on vacation and all of the OEMs have in the meantime models where you can choose your model with, with very, very short notice period. I, you know, it's, um, I think it's Audi on demand. It is Volvo, Care by Volvo. And I forgot what the Mercedes name for it is, et cetera. So you can drive what you want. So on a day-to-day -day basis, you drive a smaller car like a, you know, like an A1 battery electric vehicle and, and a, a range of, let's say, 150 to 200 kilometers. You want to drive on vacation? Well, then you take an A3, which has that range, or a Q, Q4 uh, e-tron or whatsoever. I think I agree to, to, to what you're saying. But um, the challenge we have here is probably behavior change. So, yep. so the behavior of people is pretty much in a way tied to their past and thinking. Mm -hmm. Yes. There is also a lot of education, if you ask me, that's missing about battery electric vehicles and even misinformation or fear, uncertainty and doubt that every day is going into the news upside down. And these people, I mean, it's a little bit like people who've been driving an ice vehicle and I've been doing the same. I mean, I've been always driving ice vehicles my whole life, right? So. Yep. If you make a switch, um, you, you, you understand the beauty of a BEV, but um, before you have a lot of questions and you probably don't necessarily get the right answer. And um, the, uh, they are also looking for justification that, that what they've been doing in the past has been True. right and they, they don't need to feel bad about climate change or about not having a BEV. I mean, just yesterday, one of my best friends ex explained to me that, I mean, I said to him, you know, you, you, it's overdue that you have a BEV. And he said, well, I need to drive this 900 kilometers in one, you know, that's about my reaction about that. So um, actually, I enjoy the breaks <laughs> that I have. It's much more relaxed traveling and you, you arrive much more relaxed and everything. It's, it's, life is better, you know, <laughs> it's just like that. So uh, before I, I did the same, I've been driving long distances and, and arrived very tired. And even in the next day, I felt really exhausted. So um, there's an, an element of behavior change and, and you also touched on the charging network that, that is needed for that, which is still lacking in, in certain areas. It's a disaster, I can tell you. It is like we have, we the OEMs have been bashed by the politics all the time. And, and you know, we were the bad guys that didn't build the cars, et cetera, et cetera. Now we have all these beautiful cars and we have a great offer 
And guess what? We don't have the charging stations. It's it's so frustrating. I can't believe it. <laughs> so I think we hear obviously every second day from some top manager automotive industry um, asking the governments to spend more money on charging networks, which leads, I mean, to two things. Number one, you, you certainly know that, that Elon Musk said that he's uh, opening the supercharger network to, to all um, Uh, end of the year which you know i want to see happening um he's talking a lot which is great but we will see if this is really happening to all brands i'm not 100 convinced yet but i think would be great um in terms of having a better long distance charging network just yesterday i talked to an id3 owner a vw id3 who told me you know his car is great he's happy with it Yes, there are problems with over the year and software, but the biggest problem is the charging if he wants yeah. to go really on a distance, um, which is for me as a Tesla owner, I, I don't even look on the state of charge when I jump into my car, even if I have a long distance travel. I mean, this is like an ice car. I don't care. And I don't have a problem because there are chargers everywhere. So question. Um, question yeah, of course, it helps when there's chargers, uh, superchargers along you know, the main routes and and elon doesn't do that for because he's such a great guy and and you know such a uh, social uh, person he does it obviously also for uh, you know money he's going to charge and then then and then there's nothing wrong with that you know of course not so i think it would be good you know that there is a big effort and i think you know we as as the automotive industry have spent billions and billions on building up charging networks uh, you know, for the vehicles very, very much in the US, but also in Europe. So yeah, join the effort makes it better for everybody who offers electric cars. So if you, if you say we as the automotive industry spend, you talk about Unity and other things exactly. where money been flowing in, which is still a separate company. So a legal entity is separated. But they uh, spend our money. They spent sure. the billions coming from, from VW, Audi, BMW, Mercedes, and I think Ford is also part of that. I'm not so sure, but yeah, I think Ford, Ford is. Yeah, I think, I think they are. But if you look at the you know, quality of service, um, you know, um, people are not really that happy also with the costs associated per kilowatt hour. So it's pretty expensive. It's fast, it's expensive, and it doesn't work all the time as supposed to. So... Would you say that, I mean, Tesla obviously has a has a huge advantage because they have this working network around the globe. And um, if you look at the BEV sales numbers, we do see, yes, we see growth. I think we see quite impressive growth, partly from particular from German companies here and there, but they are still lagging behind in, 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 in the charging. If you think back to your days at Audi, for instance, With what you know today, what happens in the future and how fast it's going to happen, would you have, you know, started your own charging network like like Tesla? No, we have it. That that is again, we we have a a, a you know a multi billion investment made into the rollout of fast charging stations along the European and North American <clears throat> main travel routes. And it is in the rollout, and I, to be honest, I don't really exactly know the number of charging stations uh, which are already there. And I, I bet you are right, and I think Herbert Dies even wrote about that uh, very bad user experience. He was kicked out a couple of times when he was trying to charge his ID4. It was very uh, uncomfortable, et cetera, et cetera. I think that is a big drama and a disaster. Uh, and it needs to improve, and that needs to be, you know, clearly put in front of our partners who have spent our money on rolling this out. Um, and this is not an excuse. If you look back like 10 years ago when Tesla is starting to roll out their network, they had big problems with their start charging points as well. And then you can say, okay, yeah, they were just quicker and faster and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, of, co of course, because I didn't have to worry about anything else but electrification, which in, in the case of, of you know, the traditional OEMs is a completely different uh, uh, business model where you do have 600,000 people that may, more or less their families live off the production and the sales of conventional cars. 
again, it's not an excuse, it's an explanation. Mm. Uh, would it be good to have it rolled out quicker and better, etc.? Yes. Would it have taken more billions? I don't know. Uh, I think it's um, the, the the utilities. I mean, the eons and the you know RVEs, etc. It's a drama. Why haven't they started investing in it? Wouldn't that have been their business? I mean, we we didn't build up uh, uh, gas stations as OEMs because there was the Shells and the Exxon's of the world that were making good money with it, right? But Why it didn't? Sorry. Yeah, I mean. This argument I, I hear quite often from automotive managers, and you know, if you if you think in a holistic way at uh, about BEVs and the user experience, um, charging is kind of a part of that. And you're absolutely true. Of course, uh, OEMs never invested in gas stations. It's just not your business. It's a different business line. But you also mentioned lately, and I consider the charging in terms of vertical integration, a part of the overall business experience for someone who's buying a BEV. So my last question before I bought a Tesla was, you know, do I have enough um, charging options? And the answer was positive. And I was happy later on with this, this, this use, but I wouldn't be happy without, without them. However, um, it really depends on the user. The question I have here, I mean, it's it's not only the, the supercharger network it's also the battery business it's it's going down to the chip business i mean we are yeah, talking yeah, about yeah, the yeah, vertical, yeah, yeah. vertical integration where i see that the oems here in germany in particular are trying to keep somehow their supplier structure in place in order to develop bevs um, is yeah. that a, i mean what what do you what would you recommend to your peers yeah if you I, if you could yeah, I, I did, by the way, because I've written a book just of, you know, it, it was published uh, uh, this week, came to the market. Um, and it's about, you know, Aufstieg aus der Blechliga. And it's about exactly this. It's about the future of the automotive industry. It is about what has to be done to survive and, and become a real player in the future when all the tech companies with infinite money and infinite technology and infinite software engineers really play, uh, you know, the drum inside of automotive business. And yes, uh, we have been over years and years and years trying to optimize our, to minimize our vertical integration, which was a big mistake. We just thought that the supplier is going to do the job better than us, and it could be a bit cheaper, and we didn't have all the structural costs, etc. Big mistake. I think we, we lost know-how and competence in areas where we are suffering today very, very much. Um, and again, lately, uh, in the last six months, not only by you know, announcements, but also by, by real movements, um, the industry has reacted. Uh, VW is building up six uh, new battery plants. Uh, they have a very strong cooperation uh, with uh, with Northwold, uh, which is is you know good friend of mine uh, Peter Carlson, who who is the founder of of Northwold. I have actually brought Peter into uh, VW and started the first discussions there. Uh, and and as you know that VW is is heavily invested in in North Northwold. We have um, a or V not we VW has heavily also invested in the next generation of a battery technology, which is solid state uh, with, with quantum scape, hundreds of millions. Um, they all three have built in, and by the way, also the suppliers have built up or are building up competence in software development. Um, you know, Cariat inside of EW, uh, is an organization supposed to be with, with 10,000 people. I don't think it needs 10,000. I don't think that you know, the quantity is the right factor to measure it on it its quality. Um, and it's not easy to get these people into you know, big organizations like that. But at least decisions being made and are um, in, in, you know, in the realization uh, phase. 
And there's one other thing which we right now suffer tremendously under is of course the, the you know, silicon and, and the semiconductor shortage, uh, which uh, is, is unbelievable, but was absolutely foreseeable. And, and you know, we all ignored it, closed our eyes because we didn't want to hear it because we have supply chains in place that are no longer sustainable and, and acceptable. You cannot fly all the stuff or ship it around the globe twice and, and put, you know, micromanage this and put those pieces then together, in, you know, from parts to systems, then into part of the vehicles. Um, and, and that is no longer possible. Corona showed us uh, that, it, you know, this supply chain breaks. Um, Fujiyama, uh, what, what, yeah, Fuji, Fuji what, what was the earthquake in, in, in Japan? Fuji, Fujiyama. Um, uh, earthquake and, and the, you know, Fukushima. Fukushima, Fukushima, Fukushima. I'm sorry, Fukushima. Uh, earthquake and, and nuclear plant catastrophe, uh, you know, just cut the uh, supply chains in, into parts. This needs to stop. We need to have those kind of uh, global foundries in Europe. We need to support that. We need to spend hundreds of billions. I mean, literally hundreds of billions to get back into the game and not be dependent on American technology uh, from NVIDIA and, and uh, Intel and, and you know, Qualcomm and those guys, uh, or from China, the Huawei's of the world. If we don't in Europe really take a big, big, big piece of money and put it into um, a infrastructure of these global foundries, but also into research and development in, in semiconductors, we will be dependent forever and we will be forced out of business. So um, first of all, I'm, I'm really happy that you mentioned your book. So I, I haven't read it yet. I only read the abstract, but I, I definitely will. And I will put the, um, a link for the book um, in the description of this video. Um, because um, this is very important. I mean, why am I here is simply because I'm with my very, very small megaphone trying to create a little bit of awareness about what you actually are saying. And I believe that your voice is much better heard in the industry and from your peers. So um, that's great that you wrote. Which this. not all of my peers like, I have to say, but I, 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 to defend myself, I have never pointed at anybody else. I have always pointed at myself uh, as being. Which is fair, but let's, let's be honest. This is, and I can say this because I'm German. This is a, this is a German, you know, political correctness here. At the end of the day, we need to talk truth. And I think that yeah. you do this. That's why actually I'm, I'm so happy to have you here as an interview partner because um, this is very rare that people are talking truth and really saying what the problem is. And you just said that. There's, I fully agree. It's billions and billions that need to be put into that. I'm even worried about even if we do this right now. I mean, let's take VW as an example. The six uh, different factories, and you mentioned uh, Northvolt. Uh, the Salzgitter factory from Northvolt is not going to be done anymore from Northvolt, from what I've heard. Um, so there are a lot of changes. The other factories are more or less announcements without having a partner yet who is doing that, from what I've heard. Maybe you know more. Um, I, I guess so, which is then great. But what I'm trying to say here is probably taking two or three or four years uh, to, you know, Build a construction and yep. and before first products are coming out Absolutely. of there. Absolutely. So That's in that time, in that time frame, two to four years, in a in a fast moving uh, transformation to BEVs, and we see in the service that the people are really longing for good BEVs and they buy whatever they can get. Um, my question is, if market share is lost, that it's very hard to capture and and get back again. I mean, be, let's be honest, brand loyalty in Germany is very, very high to the German brands, which is mm -hmm. which has always been. But this is a, now a new situation. And you just mentioned digitalization and software, which goes along with batteries. So you can't differentiate the one from the two. This goes hand in hand. 
Um, the question I so I'm asking me what's going to happen in the next two to four years, hoping that the battery supply and hopefully semiconductor supply is better at that time and day, and hopefully the software development with uh, you know the different operating systems. And they all try to um, develop. I mean, um, Mercedes-Benz is trying that, the same as BMW and VW. And you mentioned before that you find this pretty questionable, that everybody is trying to develop his own OS. So Absolutely. long story short, um, time is uh, time matters and is critical. Yep. So if they don't catch up very quickly in the next two to four years, isn't it true that most of the German companies are going to shrink? Yeah, if they wouldn't catch up and if they wouldn't have competitive products. I mean, again, you know, of course, in, in some details, um, when it comes to really the you know, pure battery electric car, the Tesla is still the best vehicle, probably. Uh, you mentioned Neo a bit earlier. I think they are uh, also very, very strong uh, brand and technology-wise. Um, but you know, the cars that have been launched now and will come and and you know, I, I can say that I started more than twenty programs when I was uh, you know uh, head of R and D and design at Audi. Um, those are going to be really very, very competitive vehicles and they will find uh, you know, a, a big, big market acceptance. I have no doubt about that. Um, and with that, I don't have any fear on market shares drastically go down or whatsoever. Um, automotive business is, is a longer term business. It takes time for developing cars. It takes time to build up factories. I think you're absolutely right. You know, until the you know, Salzgitter plant uh, probably is up and running, is likely Three years from now, and, and others going to follow and going to follow around the world. Um, but it is not that there is, you know, huge differences anymore. So uh, great cars, uh, and, and it has the, the strengths of, of the German brands, of course, which is premiumness, which is finesse, which is fantastic design. Um, yeah, all of that is a, a great package, and we see that already. Uh, sales numbers are picking up significantly. I think, you know, I don't know the latest and greatest, but I think that VW could sell significantly more uh, ID3s and 4s if they had the supply right now and could get the chips and all of that stuff. So, um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about sales numbers. So if you we, if we, if we look at the German sales numbers, for instance, Q1 and Q2 compared, and I have the numbers here in front of me, we have Daimler from 17K to 21K. And I talk about global sales. So in percentage, this is a great growth, but in absolute numbers, this is still tiny. BMW from 14K to 22K. Actually, the CEO Zips just said the day before yesterday in a CNBS interview that um, they are growing faster than Tesla, which which is kind of a little bit funny because you probably meant the percentage on the BEV side, um, but he honestly said that. So VW um, is, and this includes um, Porsche and Audi, VW is growing um, to 110K in Q2, which is, which is great because Tesla was from 185 in Q1 to 200, 201K, so thousands in Q2. So what I'm trying to say is, they are growing partly from 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 lower base, but they are growing quite successfully. However, if you look at the global market, about fifty seven percent of all BEVs right now are sold in in China. Mm -hmm. So um, it's I think eighteen percent the US and twenty two in Europe, something like that. Yep. Um, so in Europe, the the German brands and you mentioned ID three and now the ID four is actually doing quite good. So. VW Group doesn't look bad, but I'm worried about China. And I, before I, we are recording this here, I've been sending a tweet because I've been seeing insurance data from China for ID3 and ID4 and ID6, uh, not ID3, it's not sold in China, ID4 and ID6. You know, um, from January to, to July, so in, in seven months, there's been 9,000 ID4 sold in China, 9,000, uh, which is really not an impressive number. No. And um, I'm, I'm worried about 
this markets. We know that Chinese are very much technology driven. And yes, you know, German brands and loyalty and fit and finish and luxury may still sell well on the premium market here in Europe and maybe even in the US and with some people in China. But but the, the, the you know, the same is actually true in, in the US. If you look at and you can claim, well, that's Tesla's home market. So no, 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 I mean, no surprise that 70 plus 80 percent of the market is, is with Tesla there, which is impressive. So I'm asking myself if ICE numbers go down and if China, if the Germans are not more successful in China than right now, there is Europe left for them. And uh, so I agree to your point. Yes, they are picking up and they do battery business and there's more software coming. But um, looking out there, it, it all depends if you ask me about the pace of innovation, to what extent they really can bring competitive BEVs to markets that impress. Yeah, also if you look at the, the numbers, I can tell you it's probably within uh, early next year that VW has uh, overtaken uh, Tesla in, in the sales numbers of, of battery electric vehicles, I would assume. Um, first thing. Second thing, um, growth is going to happen in China and in the US very much with the new products coming. There is you know, a bunch of products, a real bunch of products coming, um, specifically also on the Audi side, where Audi is you know, quite strong in the US, uh, VW isn't that strong in the US, but, but Audi is, is very strong in the US and in China with, with fantastic products, uh, which, which I know. Um, and that's going to be very, very, very successful in China and the US. And as you know, all products before they get really decided on design, on technology, on everything, they get tested in the different markets. Um, and not only on you know, uh, design, but also on features, on connectivity, on you know, all these kind of elements. And we got extremely positive uh, feedback on, on the cars from the US and China. So I will um, be relatively or absolutely relaxed that the strengths of uh, the brands in China and in uh, US will be at least as good as in Europe um, and at on the BEF side, at least as good as on the ICE side. Okay, if we if we haven't had a bet already on a bottle of champagne, I would <laughs> I would do a second, but um, that's fine. I mean, I'm 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 really appreciating that we have some disagreement also, which is which is awesome, which is fantastic. I personally um, not that much convinced, about, in particular about China, Asia, and the US in terms of the German BEVs for the future. I agree that some really exciting products are in the pipeline, but we will see. We will see. I mean, there's, you know, I'm, you are right. When you look at China, there is a lot of companies that have, uh, in the meantime, products which are very affordable, very affordable and, and quite good, I have to say. And there are you know, many examples. Neo, I would not put into that category because they are very expensive, but very good. But there's others that do good electric vehicles for mind-blowing prices. Uh, let's put it this way. But that is, you know, the challenge for all of us, uh, including Tesla, to be able to meet those kind of product costs and to meet those kind of sales prices, which. I think it is at least as um, as complicated for Tesla as it is for uh, the European or German brands. They have one advantage and disadvantage in its in itself, with having to have joint ventures. So they have access to the Chinese market in a, in a very very strong way. They have also access to Chinese suppliers, which you know very many times belong to the joint venture partner and with that to um, you know material cost prices which we and North American OEMs cannot even imagine um, so that's the strength on the other hand in a joint venture you always have to make a lot of compromises I think Tesla was the second uh, uh, OEM not having to do a, a, a joint venture inside of China uh, Volvo cars was the first one by the way. Hmm. Um, I didn't know that. Okay, yeah. interesting. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, because we had a joint venture with ourselves um, instead of Geely Group. Um, so, yeah, long story short, it's not all bad being in a joint venture. It gives you certain opportunities and access to uh, suppliers which wouldn't be maybe on the first list of the regular purchasing person sitting somewhere in Ingolstadt, Stuttgart or Munich. So, um, yeah, I think I agree to that. Um Talking about advantages and disadvantages, one area where a lot of people call Tesla to have an advantage is because they are building new factories like the one in Berlin, which new technology like the mega casting front and rear and, you know, integrated battery into the structure as a structural element. And then and a couple of other, from a technical perspective, really exciting developments. And we know from reverse engineering from tear down that the that the OEMs at least at this point in time are not there or don't even plan for this, I don't know. But all of that will have an impact also on costs, but also on the specifications of the vehicles, uh, which is reflected later on and you know battery on consumption, efficiency, and you name it. Do you see the uh, manufacturing capabilities of Tesla that for a long time have been, you know, smiled at, in particular here from, from Germany, uh, nowadays as an advantage? Oh, uh, to be honest, I don't really know um, whether they do have an advantage or not. The advantage of Tesla, what they are doing is they take risks in areas where traditional OEMs wouldn't take risks. And they would just say, okay, we stick with what we know and we stay with that. And it worked for you know, the last generation. Why would we change that and take a big risk? In, in failures, et cetera. And I think Tesla has paid their price for it. Uh, not everything they do it starts to be fantastic from day one. Um, and then mm-hmm. they go through a very, very painful exercise on fixing it. And I don't think that a company like Audi or you know, I would say a, a other premium companies would be willing to afford going through these kind of quality problems. Again, you know, it's, it's different. You, you start in one factory and that's where they started having built up all that. It was like a year or something like that where they were completely underwater. By the way, a, a very uh, well uh, or high, um, um, how do you say, mit Hochachtung versehener ex-Audi Kollege, you know, a guy with a good, good very good manufacturing reputation uh, okay. had, coming from Audi, Uh, had helped Tesla to build a factory that works. Um, <laughs> and, and they have st- stolen more than, than just one guy from Audi, in particular in the, in the manufacturing field. So I don't, I'm not sure whether they really have an advantage. But again, they do things more aggressively, take more risk into um, their processes, and they have good stuff. I mean, of course, if you look at um, you know, part uh, of, of, the, uh, of the structure of the vehicle, Uh, you know, the battery cage, etc. cetera. I, I have to say that even though you, you don't want to hear this, I would have <laughs> not released that car. If my team would have developed the Tesla Model 3, I would have not released it because I would have found myself with one foot into jail. And, and I, I, you know, <laughs> okay. I wouldn't have done that. And we understood, uh, we understand, understood uh, the Model 3 very, very, very well. And there was a huge amount of, super interesting and good stuff. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to you know, down talk this, but it is not that for, you know, we were, um, uh, you know, it, it, we weren't impressed by everything. I mean, uh, you're not alone with this critical point of view. And I actually agree, even if that's maybe surprising to you. I mean, we know that the Model 3 ramp almost broke the neck from Tesla, you know, yeah. um, And uh, they've been in a situation there where they had to push it into the market because yeah. the cash flow was an issue at that time. Yeah. And I remember um, that very well. And, yeah. and you can see that. And, and, and not, I'm, I'm not trying to blame or whatsoever. I'm just no, saying. No, I mean, that's from totally, my, fair. totally that, fair. That's, that, that's my, let's say, subjective view, mm-hmm. whether it's true or not. Can, others can judge on that. The focus on manufacturing cost is important. Absolutely. No doubt about it. And Elon has decided to go for an enormous degree, I mean, a very, very, very high degree of automation, 
which almost killed the company. True. Um, and once you have that under control, you can replicate that. Um, it's not always the best uh, model for lower cost countries, but it's specifically in Europe, in you know, Western Europe, like in Germany, it's a very good model because you don't need that much, any people and, and you know, human labor, uh, you use automation um, for, for doing that. But there's one caveat to it. The manufacturing costs are in the broader scope rather low versus material cost. Mm -hmm. The win and loss of a vehicle is determined by the material cost and the difference from the material cost to the sales price. Um, yeah, and, and, and all the talk specifically, you know, Tesla does around how far advanced they are on the manufacturing side doesn't uh, make them profitable. It's the material cost versus price that de de defines the profitability. And then low ma manufacturing costs is the cream on the cake. I agree to that. I think what, it, what is changing nowadays, and we see this already happening, is that more and more on the added value part is coming from the software side. I mean, exactly. and I've been working 20 years only in software and I can yeah. tell you the margin there is quite impressive. Yeah. This is nothing that you want to compare with, you know, you have in the traditional automotive industry and you just mentioned the material cost. Yeah. All of that is kind of doesn't mean anything anymore. If you, for instance, sell for $10,000, um, you know, driving assist or level two driving exactly. assist system as Tesla is doing that. So the key question, and this leads to the next topic here around autonomous vehicles is really uh, to what extent um, the traditional automakers, Germany and elsewhere, are also able to follow that path or provide, you know, solutions. And with all the startups you are engaged in, you're participating and adding value here and there. And I believe there's right now, as we talk a new industry forming, this is why of what I feel, yeah. um, because you need a lot of suppliers to make this happen somehow. That's number one. Tesla is doing kind of all and everything, almost not everything, but the, the majority of the important factors inside. So the question I have is, um, if we are in five, five or 10 years from now, let's assume that, you know, Level three is pretty normal. There are some vehicles with level four driving around already. Um, you know, there are some vendors who really mastered it. I don't know if it's going to be Mobileye, Argo AI, Waymo, or Tesla. But, um, you know, the majority of the profits is probably going to, to the companies who are able to provide the solutions on top of that, what is a normal vehicle. Yeah. So what is, going to happen, what is going to happen in your point of view to the industry then in the next five years? I think there is happening a lot and has already also started. And of course, you know, you, we see things happening in traditional OEMs, which Tesla has started with, put all their uh, autonomous drive or autopilot kinds of hardware into the vehicle, even though people don't buy it. And then they can, you know, switch at the on. end, uh, switch it on like this. It's going to be over the air and then you can drive autonomously which they can't, but you know, at least at the level two, two plus kind of level. And people are really willing to pay money for that. And they are specifically like in, you know, in Silicon Valley, people are so technical and, and, and you know, technology affine that they really love it. And they, they would spend you know, almost anything for it. And it shows that there is value beyond the normal value creation of producing and selling cars. And I think that's also understood by um, the traditional OEMs. Volvo Cars, for example, announced that the next um, XC90 that's going to be launched will have as a standard a lighter being integrated in the roof of the vehicle, allowing you know significant improvement in ADAS and, and maybe going to level three of autonomous drive or something like that. Um, and there's a religious war ongoing, whether it's LiDAR or it's cameras or it's radar or it's all of, of all, but I can come to that question later on. Um, what I'm saying is, yes, you're right. Um, the value chain needs to be um, extended and is one of the, how shall I say, uh, you know, dreams of all the uh, traditional OEMs to participate in that. And it is going to happen. Um, 
you know, we had when we lo launched the Etron, uh, we had the idea of let the customer choose on their, you know, um, uh, lighting uh, sequence when you shut down the car or switch it on, etc. Um, and and you know, it's it's probably I don't know, it's probably not a big business where people say, okay, it makes a big difference, and I want to spend money for it, but it shows. There's awareness and there is technology being developed that uh, in, in enables that. What is a technology enabler for this? It's over the air. It's over the air updates, um, which you know, is right now actually reaching a second phase um, of the technology. Um, it was Tesla and it was Red Band. Red Band right now owned by, by Harman, owned by Samsung. Um, they were the uh, inventors actually of this over the air. And I think Red Band had a really hard time running around, you know, talking to all the German OEMs and nobody said it's interesting to us, but we don't need that crap and leave us alone. And it's just playing around, etc. Guess yeah. what? It, it, you know, all of a sudden everybody wanted to have it. Uh, anyways. So the current systems still need to have your car being at a charging station, being in the garage, not being able to drive, et cetera, because they copy the files actually, and that needs extra memory. And then they have to switch back and forth between the different status. Um, and if I may say so, uh, there is a company, a little Israeli startup called Aurora Labs, who has revolutionized that and is uh, actually optimizing this over the air by really optimizing the line of code. So they can laser sharp, cut out the line of code that is corrupt, replace it, can always fall back to a safe state uh, version and can do that while driving, doesn't need any extra memory inside of the ECUs. With that saves hundreds of millions of costs in uh, you know, a big fleet like, you know, a, a uh, OEM fleet, which produces, well, let's say, one and a half million vehicles per year. That is absolutely unique. And uh, we are about to bring this in, in production. We have contracts, I may say, with two leading European OEMs, which I can't disclose at this point of time. But that shows that technology right now is going so fast that even the inventors, which were like, looked at, wow, this is almost impossible what they are doing, you know, falling behind or can't catch up. And the good thing is, it is two traditional European OEMs who have signed contracts with this company uh, to bring this into production ASAP. And that is, is making me feel good on one side because I'm, I'm the chairman of the board of this company, uh, but also, still a automotive guy and and of course i have uh, a lot of hard blood in in this industry sure. seeing that there is this understanding yeah we need to do something radically different and we need to take some big steps forward to be able to catch up with companies like, like tesla totally makes totally sense and it's really exciting to hear that because the implications are very severe i mean see uh, as you said um over the air is a bottleneck for many, and Tesla has been okay. leading the, 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 the pack here, but this doesn't stop here, so it's, no. it's changing. And um, having this uh, as a capability while you're driving is actually definitely next level. And um, the implications in terms of energy consumption, exactly. as well as uh, elimination of errors, is uh, and bugs is another um, another positive. So I, I could I could talk a lot about how exciting I find this. So congrats for your contracts that you did sign. So I'm going to look forward to that because if you talk about OTA, which is so important to activate this um, additional software revenue and the high margin. Yeah. Exactly. Um, we, we know, for instance, that VW is still struggling with ID3 and ID4 in terms of, of enabling that. And, um, you know, and others like, like Porsche, the Taycan is still not really doing this too. So you have to drive into a service point, which is kind of waste of time and money. 
So I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that these developments are happening and it also shows that this is not the end of the story. So okay. it's all about the innovation that is happening and continue to happen on the one side. On the other side, you have to have an integrated um, system. This is not just this one element. So everything needs to work seamlessly together, which is a problem because you have interfaces with a lot of suppliers and the OEM, they are trying to bring the solution somehow together. Yep. which is, and every interface is a, is a possible issue and error um, area where things can go wrong. So I agree to your point that, you know, some may overtake Tesla here and there uh, in certain areas, but the complexity is, is pretty, pretty much growing there. And um, we will see how this develops. Um, I'm not sure if you've been as crazy as I am that I woke up at four in the morning or so watching the Tesla AI day. I hope you you didn't do that. No, no. Um, no. For me, as a, as a little bit of a nerd, um, that's been really um, very much attractive to listen to. And I'm not sure if you have later on had the opportunity to uh, to read a little bit or to listen in a little bit. Oh, of course. So what is your take? Yeah, this is a typical Elon Musk. I think he has always um, some ways to surprise people. And, and I think you said it the evening before, there was a video with his wife dancing with robots or something like that. Wasn't that, the, the, didn't he Twitter something like that? It's and it, then, yeah, yeah and, and of course, you know, this was uh, somehow the, expecting that it goes into the um, robotics kind of uh, area. I did not expect him to be you know, crazy like this, but he always does that. Um, and yeah, of course, that is possible. And, and, and people around the world do research on that since years um, to find really human-like kind of robots. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether human would be the best uh, in, in that. It is a combination of, of normal robotics and and human-like mechanical and, and you know, of course, sensual um, uh, capabilities. And yeah, it would be great if the sensor systems of the vehicles could be reused, etc. For me, this is, you know, this is, uh, what shall I say? Um, <laughs> it's very good marketing, let's put it this way. And I, you know, I'm, I'm sure he will spend a lot of money. And at one point of time, you will see those guys walking in, in Tesla factories um at one point of time well i think you know um first of all and you you certainly know that this has been a recruiting uh, event so this is not for the ordinary normal um population or you know yeah. pe person and uh, so he's trying to attract talent, which is, I believe, one of the critical and key um, areas um, all OEMs should look at. Um, so it to attract the, the, the smartest people makes a difference, in particular here in software. So um, the, the bot, the Tesla bot, obviously, you know, got all the headlines. But the reality is the other, the other parts that has been presented are much more exciting, at least to me, uh, which is the D1 Dojo ship, as well as the, the way how the neural network evolves and the supercomputer they have um, built there in terms of training, as well as how they create vector space in neural networks for automotive vehicles. So I've been digging um, to, to, to the extent I'm able to uh, deeper into that because uh, I find this uh, very exciting. Why? Um, you know, all of what Tesla is trying to accomplish here will be on a lower cost base than what other automotors, automotive or supplier companies are doing if they work with vision only, and if they are able to work with the video sequences and the pictures they are getting and uh, self-learning you know, neural network is improving in a high frequency um, over time. And you certainly have also seen full self-driving better videos from, from vehicles in the US driving around. And over time, this is pretty impressive how this is improving. So a lot of people are saying, and I'm a part of that, that I believe um, Tesla is leading here in terms of moving step by step into what I call level four. Uh, but we also have to be careful with these levels because this is more liability 
definition and and less a capability de definition in yeah. my understanding. But yeah, I you know if if you ask me honestly, I would say that uh, Waymo is still leading. Uh, they are probably falling behind because they use old-fashioned technology on on their uh, um, on their um, uh, object uh, recognition and and um, and uh, vision side. Um, I do not believe in uh, cameras only. Of course, if the cameras have the capabilities of human eyes, which is not going to happen in the next, I would say 10, but I can say five years, um, then that uh, changes drastically. And that is a vision for the future. Uh, I do not believe in LiDAR at all. I think it's a waste of time and money and it's only cost. I very much believe in the combination of radar uh, for certain objects and, and uh, situations uh, where cameras are struggling. Um, but the main focus is also, in, in my point of view, is, is clearly the camera and, and the object recognition machine behind it. Um, even though you know, Tesla from the OEM side might be the furthest, uh, from the experience side, the driven miles, etc., Waymo is by far further. And of course, you know, we can all say, yeah, 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 but it's going to be artificial and deep learning and you have, don't have to drive all these kilometers. I think it's a combination of both. I am um, invested in a company and, and the board member is called Recognize, which will at the end of this year um, uh, show a, a vision system that is outperforming everything which is on the market right now by a margin. It's the strongest machine ever being built for um, object uh, uh, recognition and, and, and you know, vision in terms of uh, the, one, the objects that needed to be detected for autonomous drive. It's at a thousand tops. I think the Tesla system is at 250 tops. And I don't know the current consumption the Tesla ship has, I think it's in the 50s to 100s kind of, and the recognized chip will have 1,000 tops at 20 watts. And the chip is there. You can already see that. It exists. We have it on the board, and it's going to be. It's not dreaming. It's reality. Mm -hmm. And that is what, what I think is happening right now. And maybe that uh, might also be history repeating. You know, there's, always, there's always a trigger needed for innovation in 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 our know, industry and and in i think the last 10 years we've seen many of those triggers coming from tesla but also coming from mobile eye coming from you know google etc um and then startups jump on this topic and oh, guess what they come with the next generation or you know jump over the next generation and go even a step further um, and, and be more radical and, and, and drastic in, in their technology uh, assumptions and, and targets they are shooting for. And that's fascinating. I think that's, the, for me, the fascinate, most fascinating time in my life is to see this happening now with yeah. what kind of brutal speed things can develop because we have tools like deep learning, we can train systems with synthetic data. We don't have to drive millions of kilometers. We have, kil we have tons and petabytes of data you know, from gaming and syn synthetically created that can do a much, much better job on broadening the learning and speeding up the learning of those systems. Super fascinating. I, I'm totally with you. I'm a... Uh... I'm sometimes a little bit frustrated because these people like you and me, if I dare to say, who see this tremendous developments happening right in front of our eyes, and you go out in the street and nobody even knows what you what the heck you talk about. You know, it's it's a it's an extremely exciting development that I'm seeing, and I, I agree there's going to be a lot of suppliers, and I also agree that not only Tesla but but Tesla in certain areas has shown the path and then a lot of people have been following and they may overtake yeah. them, right? And yeah. I recognize, for instance, I did an interview with the CEO a year ago, I think it was, which yep. was really exciting to me. And I wrote an article about it because I, I really have seen someone else's, you know, 
focusing on vision only, which yeah. which I really found very exciting. Um, and it's it's a liquid development. There's a lot of changing happening. But one thing that we know is that all of these developments are leading into products and services over time. Yep. And this is kind of going very fast. And yep. the bot, for instance, or what I call neural net training as a service is something that probably can change our world quite drastically in terms of what our children are going to experience, you know, and even... And hopefully we as well. I, yeah. I sure hope, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very much older than you, but still I, I hope uh, to be, be part of that. And, and, and I tell you, you know, if you think about autonomous drive and then you ask, you know, customers on do you want to drive autonomous? They say, no, it scares me and <laughs> I'm not interested in that, etc. It's all technology I don't understand and I don't trust. Okay, good. If you look at this you know, from that perspective, probably true. But if you ask you know, me, maybe norm, other normal customers, specifically younger people, would you want to play you know, video games while you're driving, you know, being in the driver's seat? Would you want to have your Zoom or team meeting while you're driving to your office instead of you know, driving the car and, you know, or would you drive to relax, take a nap, etc. those kind of things. Then all of a sudden people say, well, this sounds really great. And, and that is the perspective we have to have. And that is what that we, we don't have to listen to people that say, no, I'm scared of this electronics and they don't work. And, you know, I rather have my steering, etc. I do want to have my steering in my vehicle as well. I want to decide when I want to drive myself or want to be driven. But if I could be sitting in a vehicle driving to an appointment and have a video, you know, I don't play video games, but you know, I can watch a video, can have my Teams meeting or Zoom meeting, or can just take a nap, I would immediately spend a ton of money for it. No, yeah. no problem. I think, you know, um, it's not only you and me, there's a ton of people out there and, and latest when they experience a system and it doesn't need to be level four. I mean, even if you have just a good working level two system as a driving assist system, you already it realize helps. how much relaxing driving all yeah. of a sudden can be and, yeah. and how enjoyable. And I agree, I'm driving and myself. less like aggressive, it. less aggressive. I mean, we yeah. Germans tend to be driving fast and a bit aggressive. Once you put the, you know, the, the level two uh, kind of, you know, autopilot into it, you drive much more relaxed and not it's aggressive. Not, I mean, I, to be honest, aggressive. I had a lot of, I got a lot of tickets in my, my life, but since I'm driving with my Tesla, most of the time on autopilot, I just don't get any tickets anymore Yeah, because it's, it, it makes sense. I mean, what you're saying, let me ask you a little bit of philosophical question here, um, which, which is, which is turning in my head all the time, which is, I, I agree that people are going to experience such autonomous vehicles in the future in the near future, probably are going to uh, feel like, oh, this is cool. I'm, 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 I'm buying this immediately. But there's going to be a lot of people who just, you know, are not able to buy it or they don't want to buy it or yep. they find it kind of, as you said, dangerous, risky. Yep. We have all those Hollywood pictures in our head from AI killing people. And this is kind of a sort of an AI. And sometimes I believe there's a risk because the development is going so fast that we have kind of a divided society. So we have people who, yep. like you and me, love this and other people who just find this to be vicious and danger and it should be, you know, not only regulated, but not allowed it at all. What, yeah. what do you think about that? Yeah, it's going to happen. I mean, there's no doubt about it. it's going to happen. And you can see that already um, with many other technologies. You know, you can see that with the, the personal computer. It was, you know, when the first PC was introduced in Germany as a personal computer, people were talking about this store's personal data. And it's used to, you know, to find out your what whatever you're doing and, and Big Brother is watching you, etc. And and many, many, many people said, Oh my god, this is really the, the enemy and this is so bad, and we're never ever gonna uh, have those kind of things in, in house. And once people understood better um, and got acquainted with the, the benefits of it, etc., 
Then they adapted. It took a while, but then all of a sudden, you know, even my father being in the uh, mid-70s, he bought a computer. He had never, ever had a computer before. He bought a computer and he loved it to, you know, he was uh, um, writing on it. He was sending emails, etc. My mother-in-law, 85, she has an iPhone. Uh, and sends uh, you know pictures and 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 you know WhatsApps and and kind of stuff to to her grandchildren, and that is one of the other technologies. Yeah, you know, when the iPhone came, we all said, yeah, 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 or you know we don't need this. Only few said, oh wow, great, and we all thought that the Nokia, whatever it was, thirty two ten or so, was was the greatest thing we needed. And guess what? Nobody takes a phone anymore to to phone call. We take it for data and we take it for, you know, communicating in a written or spoken uh, manner, which nobody, you know, would have. Ex so things take time, even like a navigation system in the car wasn't appreciated by a lot of people at the beginning at all. And nowadays, of course, we don't take it in, in the car anymore because it's aged once you have uh, bought the car. Uh, you know, many people yeah. take it on their on their smartphones. But it is a normal way of driving, of course, and this will happen to things like autonomous drive as well. It will not be appreciated at the beginning by a lot of people, but it will grow. And I think the one and and you know there's two big arguments for this technology. One, for me, always the most important that it has, has always been my my driving force when I was at Volvo, pushing this technology to the boundaries is safety. We can prove that bottom line, you know, with, with all due respect, we see too many Teslas having accidents with autopilot, etc. But bottom line, we can prove with this technology, driving is safer. People get supported in situations where they can't react in the way they should react. It helps minimizing accidents. It helps minimizing fatalities. I mean, this is this is a fact very soon. I think we can probably prove it already, not knowing the the, the detailed numbers, but it will help. We know ninety percent of the of the accidents happen because of human failure. It's even worse in trucks, I can tell you, uh, but that's a different topic. Where I think that autonomous drive level three plus needs to be there in two years, three years latest because it's a business case and it is needed for safety reasons. But you know, I don't want to de derail that, that discussion. So safety, and of course, it is so much nicer to sit in a car when you are driving longer distance or driving you know, from A to B and have something else to do than just watching for traffic and, and you, know, you can do other stuff. The most important thing, argument for this is safety. I, I fully agree. I mean, safety is humans are a pretty faulty system to drive a car. I mean, we always believe we are kind of fantastic, but and but the truth is um, there are so many accidents and the data that you just mentioned, the proof, I mean, Tesla is releasing data that proves this too in the US, um, that the, the vehicle is much safer. You can argue here and there about the data, but the bottom line is still it's 10 to 11 times safer, right? And the same is definitely true for other driving assist systems from other OEMs. I mean, the, I have no doubt about that. But what I feel is there is a difference between a driving assist system and a level four autonomous driving vehicle or even a robo taxi. So the moment you, you see a car driving on its own without a driver in the seat, people going, in my opinion, um, associate some almost emotions <laughs> to this, this thing and believing this is kind of, a, you know, has some kind of consciousness. And if you think about the humanoid uh, robot, I mean, from Tesla presented at AI Day, which looks like a human with, with hands and fingers and all of that, it's not next year or a year later or a year later we're gonna see a you know prototype, but one day this thing is going to 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 work in a factory probably or in a hospital. I don't know. Yeah, it's um, going to be in the hospital first, and and I think that's where it belongs. 
and and in in the care system where we do not have enough people For we instance. pay the people poorly i think that that yeah. is an area i think i see a lot of use cases yeah. but where i want to go to is here that uh you know i agree with smartphones and and computers that people have been negative in the beginning and catching up to that and changing over time but if it comes to a humanoid robot, someone who likes like a human almost and is doing independently stuff, a vehicle that is driving like a robot taxi, I'm a little bit concerned about people, how they react on that. And sometimes I'm asking myself if the decisions in terms of regulation for autonomous vehicles is a little bit influenced by that. I mean, if we see how slow this is going, in particular in Europe, but not only in Europe, compared to particularly the US. Uh, and you know, I, I, if you look at the excellent data, you can make the claim that um, because of that regulations, we're going to have more accidents in Europe right now than compared to that what we have in the US. So, uh, I I don't know. I doubt it. I mean, in the US, it's it's, it's very. Um, clear, you know, you're responsible. There's nobody looking after what you are releasing to the market. If there is, you know, bad things happening, you have claims and, and very, very uh, expensive claims and claims and NHTSA is going to go after you and going to put a lot of um, penalty on you, etc., which is a typical American way of doing things. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. It is that's it, how it's it a is. Different, it's a different legal system, simply, yeah, how exactly. they approach stuff. So I, I yeah. agree to that. But I'm talking about safety and, and accidents. Yeah. So. Uh -huh. Okay. I, let me just quickly say one sentence on, on the regulation in Europe. Of course, it is more regulated. That's part of our, our nature and, and, and way of, of thinking. Um, it's maybe overregulated. It has made some progress lately. I think there is, uh, you know, the UN had released a, a, you know, guiding principle on that. And I think that uh, Scheuer, as the Minister of Transport, has released something as well, which could be used for homologating uh, autonomous driven vehicles, I think up to level three. I'm, I'm, I'm not really too much in that details. So there exists at least a frame in which we could, we can work. And I think the companies are working. Um, the difficulty will always be how do you test it at the end that you cannot test it. I think it is impossible to test every possible situation in the world that can exist because it is infinite. So that is a very important point you're making because, I mean, the UNECE, which is a UN organization, is regulating this in about 50 different countries, including Canada and most countries here in Europe. Um, and they are, the system is much, in, from Tesla and also others, are much more restricted here in Europe compared to the US. And you are right, there's a legal different system. But at the yeah. end of the day, if you think about safety and accident numbers, um, you, you just said what I think too, which is you, there's no way that you test the system like an airbag no. before and, and all scenarios and figure out now it's safe, now we can release it. No. So sometimes I'm asking myself if these guys have a problem, how to come to a decision um, and not about if a system is, is good or bad or should be released or not. And the law yeah. here in Germany from Minister Scheuer is actually going even to level four and level five okay. uh, for people mover in, on certain dedicated yeah, with, with, areas. Exactly, with certain speeds, et yeah. cetera. Yeah, but, but, that's, but yeah. I, I'm not, I mean, there are a few use cases where this is used, but, and maybe, you know, this is pathing the way a little bit. But still, uh, I, I don't see a big breakthrough. And I'm not talking about technology. I'm just talking about regulation. No, regulation. Right? So, yeah, you, you will see. The, the thing is also, and, and you have to be really honestly um, seeing this as, as you know, being a part of an obstacle, is we as, as the ones that are part of the board of the management releasing at the end those kind of features uh, we, we are, you know, I said it earlier, almost with one foot in, in jail because we are liable for what yeah. we release as a person. Right. Um, and of course, that's different in the US, uh, completely different. Um, and, and, you know, again, a company like Tesla can obviously deal with those cases 
easier than a company like Audi or Mercedes, et cetera, would do. Um, and in, in that environment, uh, people like me aren't as risk-taking or risk affine as, as a guy like Elon Musk is. Uh, because we just think of our family, our little house and our little whatever uh, we have, and we might lose it if somebody would sue us and, and find out that somebody has done a big mistake, etc. There's always this DNO, directors and officers, insurance, but you, you can you know, be absolutely insured. You will go through months and years of being sued, uh, etc. If, if something bad happens, even though you have followed all the rules and and regulations. So the, the price you pay as a manager is going beyond the fine. I mean, we talk Absolutely. about emotional prices and, Absolutely. And, and years of your life, which, which you waste with lawyers and, and judges. Um, yeah. There's no doubt about that. I fully understand this. In that respect, and uh, I agree that, that Elon is certainly someone who is taking more risks. Um, yeah. And, and I, 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 I think it's great. Again, he pushes the boundaries. Sometimes he does it too much, but you know, if you don't do it, overdo it, maybe things don't happen that quick. He can afford doing it because he is the guy he is, and he has always been very, very you know, aggressive and, and very successful. So all good. I have a ton of respect for the guy, uh, but he, for whatever reasons, for all the known reasons, can deal with these kind of things easier than a you know, Deutscher Vorstand in einer Deutschen Aktiengesellschaft. <laughs> that's, that's definitely true. I mean, sometimes I'm asking myself if being a founder and an owner of a company like Tesla, you have just more flexibility for certain decisions. Sure. And as a top manager, as an executive, as a CEO, I don't know. I mean, you have a few years in that position and you just try to, of course, uh, do the best you can based on your, you know, bonus malus system in that period. And also, you know, giving the, the good path forward in the future. But the, the focus area is just a few years, usually. Yeah. That's, that's, your, that's your influence that you have. So that, I, that... I do think, I, I, no doubt, what you're saying is correct. And, and there is certainly a lot of managers that, think short term on you know quarterly basis actually when they have to release numbers instead of really thinking in in broader perspectives of many years maybe 10 15 years um, but i think there's also a lot of people that are really responsible in in big companies and try to do what they think is the best for the company sure, and sure. and for their products um, and, and not all are thinking like in, in, in quarterly uh, kind of, of, of uh, you know, uh, time frames, et cetera. Yeah. So I think that's, that's a fair and good statement at the end of our um, interview. So two hours just flow by and I enjoyed the conversation very, very much again with you about your openness and, you know, clearness and clear opinion. And um, I will, I will, as I said, um, you know, recommend reading your book and will, you know. Yeah, but this myself. is not why I'm giving the interview. No, no, that's, I know clear. that. I know that. And, and the same on my side. I mean, the two of us have, I believe, some similarities. We, yep. we are kind of trying to do something to help other people understand situations better. Mm -hmm. And this is not about money. This is not about fame. This no. is not about whatever, um, which is for a lot of people hard to understand. But um, for me, this uh, is enriching for my life. And this interview was too. So I, I really want to thank you for your time. Thank you. And, um, you know, all the best for all your companies you're working with. Thank you. I'm knock on wood and we stay in touch. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure from my side as well. It always, for a good interview, it always takes two. And, and I think it, it worked out well. I had a lot of fun as well. So thank you very much. Take care and stay healthy. My pleasure. My pleasure. Bye-bye.